I don't know about you, but I like to watch, if I'm watching TV, I like to watch these uh, forensic files or 20, um, 20 something, 2020, where a crime is committed in real life and they're trying to figure out who did it. Anybody ever watch one of those? Come on, raise your hand. I'm fascinated by, you know, they get DNA now by touch. You know, all the different ways that they've now sophisticated DNA so that really there's no perfect crime scene. That if you just touch someone's sweater, you leave DNA. They can go after it. So um, I want to do a little thing today. I'm gonna, the name of this is People of the Mask, M-A-S-K. People of the mask. But the question I have for you today <clears throat> is just two questions. Who killed Jesus and why did he die? We've had assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, JFK, uh, President Kennedy, uh, Abraham Lincoln, all the way back to Julius Caesar. And if you analyze those crimes, you find out, and there's many conspiracy theories, you find out who did this and why and was there somebody behind it. And so it wasn't just the person who pulled the trigger. So the thing about the uh, killing of Jesus that makes it so hard to understand is even people who don't believe in Jesus, when they read his story in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nobody can find one thing he ever did wrong. There's no sentence he spoke that's unkind, that's racist, that's uh, misogynist, that is nasty, never. He was always working for the people's good. He went about doing good, healing those who were oppressed by the devil. So the question becomes, how could he be taken out? Who would wanna do it? For what reason? Is it some giant demon? Is it some horrific dark cloud that came over people's minds? How did Jesus die? Who killed him? Well, the story is multi-layered, as you know. So let's start in descending order from the immediate death on the cross. So you could say, who killed Jesus? The Roman soldiers killed Jesus. They're the ones who put the nails in his hands um, the Assyrians had invented, invented a crucifixion hundreds of years before, but the Romans had perfected it so it would be the most excruciatingly painful death that you could experience, and it would be slow and lingering so that everybody would know when they saw someone crucified, do not play with the Roman government. So the Roman soldiers... They were the ones who put the spear in his side. They're the ones who nailed him to the cross and the cross was hoisted up and between two thieves, he was killed. So you could say they killed him, but then that's not accurate. It's true, but there's more because behind that, he wouldn't have been on the cross if it wasn't for Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor. And Jesus was brought to him because he was the only one who could pull the trigger on capital punishment. He was the only one. No one in the Jewish culture could do it in Israel. He could give it, crucify it. And um, he was the one. It really, he died, by the way, as a madman, history tells us. And... Um, he killed Jesus because Pilate gave the order. He gave the order, kill him, crucify him. But then it's not that simple because he didn't want to get him crucified. You know the story, right? He was looking for a way out. He knew when he met Jesus, this guy hasn't done anything. And he saw the jealousy of the people who were pushing for the crucifixion. And he wanted to get out. Plus, on top of that, his wife had a dream and sent a message to uh, Pilate and said, hubby, do not have anything to do with this man, Jesus, because I suffered much last night in a dream because of him. So he had warning. He knew, he knew that he was not, 
He didn't understand them, but he knew that, that he hasn't done anything to deserve crucifixion. <clears throat> so there's someone in behind Pilate. So then it could be, you could say, the crowds. Because the crowds were the one when Pilate tried to get out of it and said, look, it's, it's, it's the custom that we release one prisoner at this season. So we got Barabbas, this criminal, wild, revolutionary, violent man, or we have Jesus of Nazareth. So let me release Jesus of Nazareth. And they said, no, crucify him, the crowd did. Release Barabbas, a revolutionary, a violent person. But, but so the crowd, in a way, there were no voices of, let, you know, that's a thought. He healed all those people. He fed multitudes. Crowds gathered around him. When he marched in earlier in the week, Palm Sunday, when he marched in, everyone was yelling, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hey, I want to just ask them, where were those folks? Because I don't see, as I read the record, of anyone going, no, don't do that. He helped my family. I don't see one person. I don't know, were they busy on the phone? Uh, no, what? lunch break, whatever it was, there was no one there for him. That's an interesting thought for all of us. When push comes to shove, who's gonna stand up for Jesus? How many wanna stand up for him? Just lift one hand. So anyway, the crowd killed him. Well, no, because behind all of that were the religious leaders. They're the ones who stirred up the crowd. They're the ones who were whispering, no, 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 no. Ask for Barabbas to be released. They were the ones who concocted the whole plot. They're the ones who got Judas on their side, paid him off with pieces of silver and said, you betray him. He was so popular, they just couldn't grab him anywhere near the temple. They had to find the right spot, the right moment. And the religious leaders of that day were obviously the ones behind the whole plot. But then the question comes to me from watching Forensic Files and 2020 and all of that. <laughs> Why? Poor K. Because there's always motive in these things. Am I correct, attorney? There's motive. When you watch these things with 2020 or Forensic Files, and they always look at the spouse. Did you ever notice that? And it's always insurance money, I'm telling you. <laughs> it ends up insurance money, boy, I'm telling you. And they're not too smart, some of these people who do these things. You know, They take out a policy a week before for a million dollars, <laughs> and then suddenly the person dies and they don't think anyone's gonna notice that. But so then why? Why? Why would the religious leaders, now notice, these were not thieves. These, was not, these were not a, a, a drug cartel. This was not a hit squad, hit men. These were religious leaders who were the most respected in society and who knew the Old Testament, the law of Moses, better than anyone. They're the ones who plotted and killed Jesus. You could look at it this way. Religion killed Jesus. Not the street, not organized crime, religion. But I wanna ask, I wanna go deeper, why? what they get from it? Well, they were motivated by two things I'd like to present to you today. And they're very, they seemingly are such everyday things. We're involved in these things all the time ourselves. So we should think now what the lesson is from scripture. The first thing that killed Jesus was jealousy. <clears throat> Pilate picked that up immediately. He was street smart. He knew, he knew how this thing rolls. So he knew they had delivered him because they were jealous. Jesus drew greater crowds, did miracles. He had answers for questions they couldn't answer. He had questions they couldn't answer. They were jealous of Jesus. He was the new guy on the block. He was rattling their world. And the thing turned from jealousy to hate. You know, when you're jealous, of, a lot of people who hate you today, if there are people who hate you, the root of it is jealousy. Sleep good tonight because they're just jealous of you. <clears throat> and jealousy turns to hate. But the one I wanna talk to you about is not jealousy. That's, we, we, we talk about that. 
The other thing that seals his doom, Jesus was gone when he did this. The people who killed Jesus, the religious establishment, were hypocrites with a capital H. And Jesus busted them and called them out and saw through their hypocrisy and used language, as you're gonna notice here, like no other language you can find Jesus ever using. You wanna talk about strong language? Oh, you know, God is a God of love and why did you correct me like that? You don't have any idea how Jesus could talk at times. There was something about their hypocrisy that forced him to call it out because they were sitting <clears throat> in, the, in the place of a religious authority. And when he called them out and he revealed what they were really like, that's it. That set them off. And they plotted and said, he's got to go. But what got Jesus killed was hypocrisy that he called out, which he's calling out to all of us. If you're a Christian and you get into hypocrisy, the Lord will start bothering you right away. I didn't hear many amens, but we're gonna get more amens as we move on here. That's what he did. Watch, and uh, Matthew tells it like this. He tells about the, 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 the coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and then he immediately, almost immediately follows that with this denunciatory chapter, Matthew 23. I mean, you gotta get your seatbelt fastened to read that. Because Jesus, as it were, just goes off on these religious leaders. Didn't he know that's what would then set them off to kill him? See, people who are settled hypocrites and are unable to be corrected, when you do correct them, they will try to kill you. They will go for the juggler. So watch how it happened. Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So far, so good. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. I mean, that was just stirring up a hornet's nest. He said, you see them? When they quote the Bible, obey what they say, but don't follow the way they live because they're imposters. They're hypocrites. This is a good thing for all of us. Hypocrisy is a terrible thing in a preacher, a Christian, anyone. <clears throat> a choir member, a deacon, a pastor, anyone. The word hypocrisy in the Greek here comes from the word of wearing a mask. Back in those days when they didn't do full costume and makeup as you'll see on next Friday and Sunday, oh, you gotta be here, come early on Friday, bring the people that don't know Jesus. Um, they didn't have makeup and all of that costume. So they took actually with a little like stick, a mask over their face and they acted out the dramas, started with the Greeks, I believe, and they would cover their face because they wanted you to know they're not who they are. They're trying to, they're acting. So that's where the word hypocrisy came from. People who wear a mask. What they seem like, that ain't them. No, that's not them. Oh, no, I saw her in church. She's fine. She had her hands up, praising God. That ain't her though. That's Sunday her. Monday through Saturday, she'll rip your lungs out. That's what a hypocrite is. How many are with me so far? Just say amen. amen. And we all are guilty of that in one way or another. You can call it wanting to put your best foot forward. You call it anything you want. But these guys had a PhD in hypocrisy. And Jesus said, call them out and said, be careful of them. They don't practice what they teach. What they talk and quote, they don't live. And there's nothing worse than someone quoting God word and talking about morality and in their everyday life, they don't even go by it. They're, they're careful, oh, uh, Jesus, there's no, pre your name is so precious, but during the week, for Christ's sake, would you give me that already? And they take his name in vain. 
There's nothing lower than that. Nothing set Jesus off like that. He never talked like this ever to any a whore in the street or any thief or any uh, murderer. He never talked like that. But false religion, that's what puts the, the spotlight on me and you. Is this real or is it fake? Is this something we do on Sundays or is this the way we live? Is Jesus everything to us or do we just talk about him and sing to him on Sundays? This is what killed Jesus, calling out their hypocrisy. But it went further than they just don't practice what they preach. <clears throat> he says later, everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes. They were called phylacteries. And when they were praying, they would wear them on the forehead and inside the little box was a verse or they would wear them on their arm, strapped on their arm and inside were these verses. It, it was a Jew, Jewish tradition and it's still practiced today, by the way, by Hasidim and or, uh, ultra-Orthodox. And uh, he said, they, everything they do is for show. On the arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes. You know, not little boxes. We're talking two by four <laughs> connected to their arm so they could show off. You think you're spiritual? Hey, check this out. It's like people who come to church in a Bible. They can't come with a New Testament. They can't even come with a normal sized Bible. They come with 600 page, 650 page, and they walk in to the church. No one carries Bibles hardly now, but they watch on, read on the phone. But back in the day, people would really go out of their way to show, I out-spiritualize you. Why are scripture verses inside? And they wear robes with extra long tassels in the front here. And they love to sit at the head table at the banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. He's saying this and they're standing right there. It's over. It's over. They could have listened, but they weren't going to listen. They were hypocrites. Hypocrites don't listen. Once they pass a line, they become settled in their hypocrisy. They're religious actors. They're, they're talking about God is love, but then they hate people in another race all during the week. And then they got, no, God is love. Ooh, yes, God is, ooh, I feel something right now. And all of that, they're going to hate during the week. They're hypocrites. Nothing worse. They give Jesus a bad name. Pastors give Jesus a bad name. How about churches that have target groups? They don't want everyone Christ died for. They only want certain people of a certain race and now of a certain age. 18, 18 through 20, 31, that's our target group. Isn't that blasphemous? Christ died for everyone, for every race. Come on, let's put our hands together and thank God for that. <laughs> so we're hypocrites. <clears throat> that's I was telling folks out in Seattle, that's one of the reasons more evangelism in, isn't done by churches is because how can you do evangelism when you don't want everyone unsaved to come in your church? You only want a certain group. The black churches want black people. White churches want white people and so on and so forth. And the younger, upwardly mobile, Gen Z and all of that, the hipsters, they only want hipsters. But that's wrong. That's hypocrisy. Jesus said, come unto me. All. How many? All. Oh, everyone. Please, on Friday and Sunday, let's bring in everybody. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. God is no respecter of persons. But here about this hypocrisy is Jesus saw through that everything was for show. Now that can come into all of us. It's not who we are, it's what we want to appear. It's not what God sees, it's what people see that we're interested in. God, of course, sees right through to our heart. He knows everything we're doing. He knows every thought. He knows how I am. I mean, what, what if you all found out that I'm talking about love and all of this, and then you work, you go to and talk to Nina, who I work with, or some of the pastors, and you, no, Pastor, he's a scoundrel. He's yelling at me all the time. Says bad things when he gets mad. 
throws books at me sometimes when I'm late. He would say, what a hypocrite. Am I correct? And I would deserve it, right? It's not how you act on Sunday, it's how you live. It's not what people think, it's what God thinks. Come on, let's say amen to that. So, God, purge us from hypocrisy because as we're gonna see, this is what put Jesus on the cross. He called out hypocrisy. I've been seeing this since I was, before I even went to church. Uh, I mean, before I went uh, thinking about uh, spiritual things, I remember going to someone's house as a kid uh, and my aunt was in the car with my mom and my dad. And we went to visit one of my favorite aunts who lived out in uh, Queens at the time. I was eight or nine and they just got a new house in Flushing and uh, everyone else lived in Brooklyn and they were there out there. And we went to the house and I was playing with my cousins and I heard my, this aunt and other people say, oh, to her sister, what beautiful curtains. What a nice apartment. This is really, what a nice house. This is really nice. And we ate a nice meal and I went home. I'm in the car riding home. <laughs> and I hear this aunt say to my mother, what a mess that place is. <laughs> What kind of schmata did she put on the curtains over there? And that, and I remember my little mind saying, wait a minute, you were the same aunt that said, oh, how beautiful, oh, this, this, this is a palace. Come on, how many have been around that since you were little, right? What is that? That's hypocrisy. Say what you mean, mean what you say, or don't say anything at all. So Jesus called them out on this. Remember when, when we're tempted to be hypocrites, when we're tempted, tempted to not practice what we preach. Now look, everyone makes mistakes. There's nobody perfect. I'm not talking about perfection here. I'm talking about that the, the regular rhythms of life are opposite of what we profess to believe. That's a hypocrite. Wanting to be impress, impressive to people, but not impressive to God. At the end of your life and my life, what will it matter what people thought? How many likes you got? What would it matter? Lastly, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites! For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy. This is Jesus talking. Full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. This is all Jesus speaking, and this sealed his doom. When he said these things, over. They huddled and went, got to go. He's, he's done. Because hypocrites never like to be called out. Some of you here, maybe you're being under conviction by the Holy Spirit because there's a lot of hypocrisy in your life. But you grew up around it. You grew up maybe in a home like that. Like, like the brother, uh, Sue, what was his name? Uh, uh, that sang that song. Uh, no, 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 no. He was here. Oh yeah, Stephen McWhorter, who sang that song about Come Jesus, Come. He grew up and his father was an evangelist and a preacher. So he would see him as a kid do that. Then he would come home and beat his wife, beat Stephen McWhorter's mother up, his wife. So the guy was, which is, what's real? He's preaching, talking about God, comes home and beats down his wife, not once or twice, regularly. That's hypocrisy. If you want to beat your wife up, don't, but <laughs> certainly don't preach. Am I right or wrong here? So, so imagine that his head was spinning. That's the Pharisees. And that's what the devil wants all of us to be. 
Hey, starting with me, he wants us all to be hypocrites. Not go and live in a drug den and, and smoke crack all day. No, no, no. Maybe he'll get to that down the road, but just start by being a hypocrite. Talk one thing and live another. And now notice the outside, that was the thing with the Pharisees. You ever hear that saying, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel? You ever hear that? It's in the teachings of Jesus right in this chapter. So they would, they would take the water and put it through a strainer because sometimes in that day, gnats, little gnats, they're very tiny, right? Would get in the water. You don't want to drink that. On top of that, the Pharisees said, no, gnats are listed in the Old Testament as an unclean thing. You can't eat a gnat. Pharisees were not going to go out and have a gnat sandwich with any of us. They were unclean. So they strain, he, Jesus said, you, you, you're, you're such hypocrites. You strain at a gnat to get the gnat out, but you swallow a camel. A gnat is like this. A camel is big. By the way, both of them are unclean. Jesus said, you, you, you look at the littlest thing and you make a big deal about it. Meanwhile, you hate people. You take advantage of people. You just want their money. All you want to do is show off to them and sit at the chief seats and have people say, oh, rabbi, rabbi. We never call anybody rabbi. We never call anybody father except our own father. We only have one father. He's in heaven. We only have one teacher, Jesus. Come on, let's say amen to that. So Jesus' doom was sealed. As I just bring this to a close, I want to point out to you that uh, I counted six or seven times where Jesus in one chapter calls them hypocrites. Why repetition? For emphasis, you're a bunch of hypocrites. He calls them snakes. In one verse, he calls them not only vipers, snakes, you're sons of vipers. This is from Jesus, it's not me, you. This is Jesus saying this. This is how he hates fake religion. Fake religion is what killed him because he called it out. He wouldn't go along with the game. He would not play the game. He would not go and take, you know, and be part of that whole hypocritical situation. So I want to say to all of you and me, whatever we're going to be, let's be real. How many want God to make you real every day? Come on, every, wave your hand at me. Real, real. Not one way here and then you go home and you talk. That, that's what breaks my heart, Pastor Petri, Pastor Hammond, all of our hearts. When we hear things as we're counseling of things that people do and say to each other in the church, coming sometimes for months or years, professing to be a Christian, I personally, my wife knows it's true, God's listening to me now. I say to my wife sometimes, I must be the worst preacher in the history of the world. How could I do this every Sunday and have people living sometimes and making decisions like, didn't you listen to anything I said? Or did you read anything from the Bible? It's very disheartening and discouraging for me. Um, because you don't want people to applaud your sermon. You want them to live in a way pleasing to the Lord. Amen. Don't we want to live in a way pleasing to the Lord? Not as hypocrites. This is why a lot of young people and, and the country is turned off to the church. Because they see so much hypocrisy in the church. You know, ministers owning two or three mansions around, uh, you know, uh, somebody just, a gospel singer just did a Christmas show, somebody here for a church that we know of, charged $100,000. I mean, really. I mean, the laborer is worthy of their hire, but I mean, really. Wouldn't pay Pavarotti $100,000. <laughs> or preachers demanding just, and then, oh, poor, or, or like this. A guy one time said to me when I was just new in the ministry, hey, Pastor Jim, I know your church. We had maybe 200 people then. So I want to come to your church. I said, well, we don't. And he knew my late father-in-law and uh, called on his own, told me he had all seven gifts of the Spirit in operation in his life, which makes you wonder a little bit who's talking to you on the phone. And he said, I said, well, we have no, we no money, honorariums, and all. He said, no, 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 no. 
You don't need an honorarium. Let me take the offering. I had never been around a swindler like that. It was all new turf for me. He said, no, 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 no. I'll take the offering. It'll take about a half hour. I'll get the pledges. Trust me, I know how to get money from people. Just told me outright. And I'll keep 80%. You get 20, no one knows, the better. Oh, yeah. That's the way the game is played for so many. You talk about hypocrite. And then when people charge exorbitant amounts of money, and God knows we don't want them on this platform, we try to guard you and try to give you the best food that we possibly can give you. But when they do that, and they're making these outright demands, some, some Christian rapper or someone, part of the demands were, we had to have a certain color a towel for him. He wouldn't just use any towel. It had to be a certain color towel. Hello? And not any water. No Poland Springs, which I took personally. I'm Polish. I, I didn't like that at all. It had to be some brand, which I had never heard of. It had to be over there at a certain temperature. It was all in the contract. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then they would get up, and I've seen this. You know what, folks? If you're going through a tough place, hang on to Jesus. Trust in the Lord. He'll come through. But he had to get his money up front or he wasn't even going to come. That hypocrisy is what's turning off our country to Christianity. Come on, how many want to see the real? Be the real. Live the real. So. Oh. I forgot. Don't delete everything I said, but have to delete it. That's not who killed Jesus. You killed him. He was nailed to the cross for me. On the cross crucified, for me he died. Yeah, God used all of those machinations that I just told you about and the religious leaders. If you would come, my brother. But the real reason he ended up on the cross is he had to because of his love for you and me. He even died for the hypocrites that he was talking about in Matthew 23. Where was their center of power? What was the most religious city in the world at that time? Jerusalem. Look what he said. <clears throat> What sorrow awaits you, teacher? Oh, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. It wasn't your destiny. You wouldn't let me. I would have gathered you with your hypocrisy. If you just would have repented and said, I need the Lord. I'm sorry, God. I put my trust in the one you have sent. I would have gathered you and protected you like, you know, those big mother birds, the birds, the little birds go out and they get in trouble quick and they just, <coughs> excuse me, fly back as fast as they can to get under the wings of that mother. And they're safe there. I would have gathered you. People tell you, anyone tells you that everything is predetermined and we have no free will. Just remember this verse when I'm telling you. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, if those people couldn't have come to him, then Jesus is a bad actor. He's crying over people who couldn't come to him anyway. They weren't the elect. But no, he wept over that city because he wanted them to come to him, but they wouldn't let him. And that's something God in his sovereignty has let us according to his plan, even though he has all power, we make the choice that determines our destiny. God doesn't send anyone to hell and rejoice. God wants all people to be saved. I said, God wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But their hypocrisy had reached saturation point. They couldn't come back now. 
And all they had to say was, oh, Lord, I need you. But as I was saying, we're all the cause of his death because God in his love had to have a substitute. So here's my sin, your sin. God's holy, someone's gonna be punished for every sin. By the way, every sin is gonna be punished, every sin. Either I on judgment day will pay for my sin or God said, no, I love you so much. I wanna rescue your, you from yourself and your self-indulgence and your sin and your hypocrisy and your acting and everything else. I wanna save you from that. So put your trust in my son. I send my son. I'm gonna put my son on the cross. He has no sins to die for but I'm gonna punish him. I'm gonna pour out my wrath on him for what you did so that you can be free. Oh, what a love. How Jesus loves. So Jesus could have called 10,000 angels and rescued himself. He could have tried to get out of the garden of Gethsemane and what was ahead of him. But no, he loved us so much, he was the substitute the theological term is the penal substitute. He was the legal one that satisfied God's holy nature so that the wrath of God was poured out. He took my sin, he gives me his righteousness. I'm saved forever, not because of me, but because of Jesus. Would somebody clap your hands and say amen, amen. So that's why Romans says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. And then one last verse, chapter five, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners, not you sinners, us sinners. We all have sinned. Praise God. What a love. Can we just give God one big loud clap of praise for his love? I stand, I stand in awe of you. Come out of here, choir. The choir looks so good today, don't they? I feel like I don't belong on the same platform here with them. I gotta work on my colors. Anybody here realize from this sermon that God is calling you? You know what, listen, look at me here, I'm almost done. The other gospel, Luke, tells us that Jesus said to Jerusalem, how many times I would have gathered you, but you wouldn't let me because you didn't, now you're in trouble because you didn't know your day of visitation. You know, there's a day of visitation. Maybe it's your day today. God brought you here today because he wants to unclutter some junk that's accumulating. He wants to get you back on the right path. Get that hypocrisy shed. Get back to simple childlike trust in Jesus. Not religion, not Brooklyn Tabernacle. That ain't gonna make it. Mm -mm. You need Jesus. You all are hiding or are you gonna come out here? We're playing hide and seek, come on. Just sing with me, just don't move, just sing. I stand. challenges today as a minister 
When Paul went out on his first missionary journey, no one had ever heard the name of Jesus. When he went to Corinth, when he went to Thessalonica, when he went and said, I wanna tell you about someone named Jesus. They were like, who's Jesus? What's, what's Jesus about? Oh, and then he had to explain. You know, the hard thing is today in America is many people who know about Jesus are not born again. They're not living for the Lord. But Satan says, no, you know about that stuff. Come on, you grew up in church in Trinidad, in Puerto Rico, or wherever. You know that. And they're as lost as can be, or they've left the right road. But they know about Jesus. So it's not like, oh, you're telling me something I never heard. And that's what I want to say to you as we sing this. If you're here today and the Holy Spirit has been like warmly in love pulling you, drawing you and saying, this is for you now. I want to bless you. I want you under the wings of the hand. Look, look as I close. You're out there. Don't be out there. That's, that's very dangerous out there. Don't, don't be out there. Come, come under the wings of the mother hand. Jesus said, I would have gathered you like a hand. I would have protected you. I take care of you. I bless you. So if you're here today as we sing that and you would like me to pray over you, I don't know how to say this because we go off. I can't describe all the different ways we go off. I know from my own life, I've gone off many different ways. But thank God he's always waiting for me with open arms. Amen. How many have found that true, right? He waits and he says, come. So anyone want to be prayed for? Come forward. I stand, I stand. Come on up. Anybody here want to be prayed for? Just come up. Come on, come to the front. Stay, I stay. I stay. 
Lord, save us from hypocrisy. For your word says, the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And in that place, Lord, truth means sincerity, being real. We're not perfect. Oh God, you know that. But don't let us settle down into a life of hypocrisy. Saying one thing, living another. Wanting the approval of people and not even caring what God thinks. Interested in how we look on the outside, but inside we could be full of dead men's bones. From me, every pastor, deacon, elder, leader, musician, sound person, security, ushers, choir, congregation, help us to be real. Help us to put on the belt of truth, again, the belt of sincerity. Let's all repeat this, not just in front. Everyone repeat after me. Dear God, I love you, Jesus. I was the reason you were on that cross. You are my substitute. You suffered the blow so I could be free. I am clean now. Not because of me, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for such love. I turn around today. I choose a different way of living. I'm gonna follow Jesus. I'm gonna trust in him. He will be my Lord and my Savior. 24-7, 365. I need you. I trust you. I love you. Watch over me. Keep me under your wings. For I ask it in Christ's name. Lift your hands with me, with your eyes closed. Come on, let's sing it. One last time, sing. someone for Friday or Sunday. But on Tuesday night, would you join with me? Uh, God helping me, I'm gonna come down early. We'll pray individually for you. The doors open at five. We'll pray individually at six. 6.30, we'll have the prayer meeting. I'll be conducting the prayer meeting. But now follow up on whatever God is saying. Follow it up. I said follow it up. Amen, follow it up. Don't let this be a drive-by. Follow it up, okay? Now as you leave, you're going to get these cards, the offering. Don't take money, take the card. Give the money. We need, we really need it. But take the cards and start talking to people, okay? Everyone turn around, hug somebody, give someone a handshake. Come on. 